Good morning. Ooh. Welcome to worship this morning. Glad that you are joining <clears throat> Um, just a couple of reminders, we are in Lent, and uh, as such, uh, we have our Lenten services on Wednesdays. It will be, uh, they post them online at 6.30 on Wednesday nights, so you're welcome to join us as we continue to reflect upon what it means to keep Sabbath um, on Wednesday nights, so please join us there. Um, also in your bulletin today is an um, uh, insert about our Easter flowers. On Easter morning, we have <clears throat> our altar area filled with e flowers spring flowers and lilies and different things. And you're welcome to um, invite you to, to make a contribution toward those flowers. And if you'd like to do that in memory or honor of somebody, you can. So there's an insert uh, in your bulletin. There's also information in the newsletter that you could would have received yet this week um, telling you about that as well. So you can turn those into the office either on Sunday when you come or it's any time during the week. Our youth are, uh, that are going on the mission trip are also selling their their flower baskets uh, to support their mission trip. They're out there between services and after service, so you'll be able to do that if you have yet to, to do that. Also, as we continue to uh, open up, we're continue to look for volunteers, worship volunteers to join us, um, either as communion assistants or ushers and, and different, uh, different responsibilities. So if you're willing to take that uh, opportunity, please sign up on uh, the Sign Up Genius. You'll find that on our webpage, or you can call the office and we can get you there as well. Um, and then today, as we, uh, as we continue to uh, have our transition time of, of finding a new uh, uh, organist, lead, uh, worship leader, uh, Noah Carlson's here today to help uh, lead us, and so we give thanks for him coming and joining us and, um, and sharing his gifts this morning as well. So with that, I invite you to rise as you're able as we can be begin our service with the confession and forgiveness that you find printed in the bulletin. <coughs> Welcome in the name of God who makes his way in the wilderness, who walks with us, who guides us on our pilgrimage. Amen. Let us confess our sins in front of God and in front of others. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace we have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. And help us to love our neighbor. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call on God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under the wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. We continue with our opening song, 10,000 Reasons. Thank you. 
Let us pray together. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our readings this morning. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Jalal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Jalal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened the cakes, and parched grain. The manna seized on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from the book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. gospel for this morning comes from the gospel of Luke in the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, this fellow eats, welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them a parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me what property will belong to me. And so the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his property with dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place in the country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out as one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and some to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I no longer am worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And so he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to, and put his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, Quickly, quickly bring a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and, and sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf. And kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead, and now is alive. For he was lost, and now he is found. 
and they began to celebrate. And now the older, the elder son was in the field, and he came, and as he approached the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called to one of the slaves, saying, what is going on? But he replied, well, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he had got him back safe and sound. And when he became angry, he refused to go in. But the father came out and began to plead with him. He answered his, he, but he answered his father, saying, listen, all these years, all these years I've worked like a slave for you, and I have never been disobedient to a command, yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And when the son of yours has come back, has devoured all your property with prostitutes, you kill a fatted calf for him? But the father said, son, you have always been with me, and you are, all of mine is yours. But what we had to celebrate and to rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life, he was lost, and now he is found. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I invite the children to come forward for a message. I know there's a couple of you out there. You are. Come on up. Good morning. So I have this plaque in my office. Can any of you read what it says? It's kind of tough. It's kind of it's it's made in like different um, letters and things. Can you say what it says? Right, creation's in the middle. Right, it says therefore in Christ there is a new creation. You know, the old has gone and the new has come. That's part. That was part of that second reading that we had today. This is one of those, it sits in my office and I see it all the time to remind me of who Jesus is for us, how he makes all things new. And especially this time of year, I was, I was out in my yard the other day when it was really, it was sunny, like today, but it was also warm, not like today. But um, I was cleaning up some of the flowers and some of the things that had died from last year and everything was looking old and kind of shabby. And I, I cleaned off all the stuff on the top what do you think I saw underneath? Can you guess? Right? The new plants. The new plants are already starting to grow up. Some of the, 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 the uh, tulip plants and things that were already starting to go to grow up through the ground, right? And the green piece was coming to remind us that here it's spring. Things are new again. We're all that old from the winter and all that has died will soon be turning green and growing just like um, uh, we see every spring. A reminder that each time, right, God renews the earth, makes it new again, so that we might remind ourselves that we have one who makes us new every day in Jesus, the one who gives us life and brings us life and does so all the, every day, not just in the springtime. So let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks because you make all things new. New in the words of your, of your son whom you sent. New in the spring that grows and reminds us of the gift that you bring of life and light into the world. Guide us every day that we may continue to look for the new life that is around us and among us and to give thanks for the gift that you bring in your son. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up today. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The parable that we hear out in the gospel is one of those parables, one of those pieces, one of those verses that we hear all the time. It's one most of us have heard all of our life at some time or another. Um, it's even out there in the culture. A lot of times when we hear about somebody who's who's gone away for a while, and then they, they come home and people celebrate, and sometimes they even get referred to as the prodigal son or the prodigal child who has come home. We use it all the time. 
So it's, sometimes it's hard when we get to these stories because there's always there's those images in your minds when you hear about, when you hear the story being read about, and you already think you know what's taking place and what will take place. It also is a reminder of, of who we are as people. Particularly, maybe, maybe all we have to hear in this story is to hear it's, a sto- it's the, the parable of the prodigal son, and those images already start coming of a child that has been gone and returned home and of a father's love and embrace of maybe the dissension because of others in the family who thinks one got special treatment over the other. It is that response. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves, why did Jesus use parables? Why did he even speak in parables? And why did he tell this one in particular at this time? We get a little bit of an idea at the very first couple of verses of our reading for today where we are told that, that Jesus is there and, and tax collectors and, sin, and prostitutes have come and gathered around him. They had come and they gathered around Jesus. They're the ones close in to Jesus. And we, said we, are here, we hear that there are scribes and Pharisees, the religious, and the, are, 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 are kind of on the outside. And they're grumbling. Why, are, why is this man, right? Why is this, Jesus, why is this man welcoming sinners and eating with them? Because in their world, in their day, it was all about who you ate with and who you, who you, uh, who you related to or uh, who you responded to, who you welcomed into your circle made a difference. It determined who you were because of who, the company that you kept. And they, didn't, they thought that Jesus, if he was who he said he was, he should know better than to hang around with sinners and with prostitutes and tax collectors and all those people on the outside. But Jesus is reminding them that it's a bigger circle. It's a bigger circle. And so he tells this story. Actually, we, he tells three parables. We skip over the first two uh, that, he, that he does in, in our verses. The first parable that he talks about is the story of, of, the, sh- of the shepherd who has 100 sheep. And then we are told the shepherd loses one of his sheep, so he leaves the 99, and he goes and searching for, for the one lost one. And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulder, he brings it back home, and he returns it to the fold. And then he calls his neighbors and friends and says, let us celebrate because the one that was lost is now found. And then he tells a parable about a woman who loses one of her 10 coins, and it says she, she sweeps the house, she lights a, she lights a lamp, and she, she looks everywhere until it is found. And when it is found, she calls her friends and her neighbors over and says, come and celebrate with me because what I had lost has now been found. The difference between those two parables and the one we heard is Jesus ends those, both of those parables by saying, and there is great rejoicing in heaven at the one who has been restored who has repented and has been welcomed back into the fold. Great rejoicing in heaven. But then we hear this third parable about the parable of the prodigal son, or maybe it should really be called the prodigal of the lost son. If you have the lost sheep and the lost coin, then you have the lost son. But it's, it's it how and how we name it sometimes that make a difference in how we hear him. But it, the, don't, and, um, the one thing that it doesn't have is how he ends the story. He doesn't end the story with, and there's great celebration in heaven. It just ends. There's no great celebration in heaven, but we do hear of a great celebration that takes place. But this parable does what a lot of parables do. They just kind of give you all the information. They give you everything to ponder and to think about and to consider, but they don't tell you the ending. It leaves you to kind of finish the story as it were. But it is how we hear that that makes a difference. How we hear when we hear the name, the prodigal son, what it is, the images that come to us. Where is it that we find ourselves in the parables makes a difference? Do we find ourselves as the older son or the younger son or as the father? Where do we find Jesus or God in the story? Is Jesus or God the father or one of the sons? Maybe in this story in particular, it's about who we are within our families. Are we the older son or the younger son? Are we the firstborn in the family or are we one of the later-born children? Do we find ourselves to be the mature mature and responsible child within the family or the 
just a kind of foolish and fun-loving one. Do we find ourselves as parents with children, do we, do we somehow change our perspective to, to be more think, thoughtful about what does it mean to be the father versus one of the children? The father waiting, longing for that one who had gone to come home, to, to long to see that one again, having not known where they had gone or where they had been. Now, in my family, I'm not the oldest of the family. I'm the second. I got an older brother and a younger brother and two younger sisters. And, but I've always been somewhat some of the, one of the more responsible children. I was the one who kind of made, helped make sure things took place and happened and, and um, wasn't necessarily the, the, the irresponsible one that ran off and just had fun. Although I did have my time. I did go off in college and enjoy myself. But I also remember sometimes coming home and helping around the place and helping mom and dad and then hearing all the fun things my, that she seemed to think that my siblings were doing and thinking, why don't they, don't they appreciate the things that I've been doing all those times? So I often felt more like the older brother in this parable. I felt more like the one who was responsible doing the things that need to be done. The other reason is the word, it call, we call it the prodigal son, which I, for, I'll say before a long time, you know, I, I didn't know what the word prodigal meant. So I finally had to look it up one day because I always thought prodigal meant, well, somebody who was wayward or lost or wandering or something like that. But what prodigal really means is to be extravagant, to be reckless, to, to spend freely without thought, which is probably another reason which I don't really kind of resonate with the younger son because while I might sometimes feel like I'm spending freely, there's a lot of thought and process that goes into that for me. But we hear, we hear parables, and we put ourselves into these things, and then we, we start judging the other characters. We start thinking about who we are, who we are and who, who are they. Maybe even a, giving a name to some of those other people. We think, oh, who is that younger son? Or maybe we hear about the story and we think, well, was he really repentant when he decided to come home? Or was he just lonely and hungry? Did he really change his mind when he was out there by himself? Or did he just make up a new story so he could figure, he, where he'd feel like he could get home and be welcomed back into the family? Did he, did he, was he truly repentant or not? Or do we think the older son is is, is irresponsible or unreasonable in his rejection of the younger son when he comes home. I mean, after all, he took all the things that his father had given him and squandered them. What do we think about the father who just seems to not really care what the reasons for the, the younger son coming home, but welcomes him with open arms? Doesn't really give a thought about whether or not he's repentant or, or sorry for anything that he did, but he's just glad that he's home they begin to celebrate. In some ways, you could really call this parable the parable of the prodigal's father because it was the father who gave out, out of love, he gave the son everything the son asked for. Actually, he gave both the sons, right? The younger son asked for what was his, and so he gave the younger son his portion of the inheritance, and he gave to the older his. So the father was left really not with much. If we believe all that he said, like the father had already given away everything that he had to one son or the other. And here at the end of the parable, it is the actions of the father that kind of caught my, my attention this, year, this time as I read through it, trying to think, well, how do, how do we tell this, this old story in a different way? The actions of the father kind of caught me because in those days, and even in our day, right, our elders are the people who don't go running out to go greet people or go out to, to find. They are the ones that people come to. And in those days, the elders would have been the ones that people would have come to to ask for advice, to come to out of respect. Yet we hear that the father has been longing for the son who has been gone, and he sees him far off, and he runs out of the house to go and to greet him. And he brings and, and tells him, you know, put on this finest robe, give him a ring and, a, and sandals for his feet, and he celebrate. He does something very uncharacteristic. 
And later, as he hears of the older son who's standing outside, mad and sulking because of what was happening inside, the father once again gets up and goes out. Goes out and pleads with the older son to come in. To come in and be a part of everything that has been going on. But can we really blame the older son for doing what he did? I mean, after all, nobody even came and told him that his younger, that his younger brother had, had come home. Nobody came and got him out of the field and said, your, your brother's here and we're going to celebrate. It was at the end of the day. It was at the end of a time of working in the fields. He has come in and found a party already started. The party started for that younger son, that irresponsible brother, that outsider that should have stayed on the outside maybe. And so the older one stays on the outside looking in, wondering what was taking place. And the father comes out to plead with him. Come in. Be forgiving. Be there. Acknowledging that everything that, that he has is the son's and all really the father wants at this point is to have his, two, have his family together, have his two sons in their house together so that they might live as one. After all, it is a bigger picture, a bigger circle that Jesus is trying to lay out in this, in this parable, telling the Pharisees that it's more than what you might think. And so the parable leaves us really without the answers, without the conclusion to the story. So we don't know if really, if the, if the older brother ever really steps inside the house to, to greet his younger sibling. Or does he, sit, does he stand outside still skeptically looking, looking inside? Or does a younger son really come out looking and working to recon, reconcile with his older brother? Or is he just thankful to have a place, an unexpected welcome, and an unexpected celebration? Is the father, is the parent who longs, he just longs to have his family once together again, to emerge, to, to, to be together in one place? It's the picture that God is trying to portray as he sends Jesus to welcome in this new kingdom of God in the world. That we all are one place in one being. A place of this new, this new reign of God, this new kingdom where rich and poor, where righteous and unrighteous, where faithful and unfaithful people gather. We're all gathered to celebrate. To celebrate around the feast that has come, the feast of the table which our God has given us. To, extravag to, to welcome and to live out of the extravagance of our God, one who, gave, who, who blesses us with untold riches of grace and peace and mercy, mercy that's poured out on all. Amen. So I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn this morning, Amazing Grace.
let us reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness, hospitality, and celebration. Send us to transform a world pl plagued by fear and confrontation. Merciful God, equip farmers and farm workers who till the soil, nourish the earth with ample rainfall and an abundant sunshine, heal grounds tainted by pollution or misuse. Merciful God, reconcile nations that experience conflict. Act quickly to bring an end to the war. Appoint peacemakers trained in the art of diplomacy and foster a spirit of collaboration among political rivals. Merciful God, Hear our your, pre your people cry for help in times of distress. Resolve disagreements among family members. Save those experiencing financial help. Hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving, especially Jerry, Ed, Piper, Kay, Robert, Arlene, Ken, Bob, Ella, Tanya, Roz, Sonia, Linda, Tim, Karen, Carol, Jane, the families of Dr. John Peterson, Phyllis Irwin, Richard Maxwell, and Jerry Loomis. Merciful God, Hear our your love comes to us when a table is set and a feast is prepared. Bless the feeding ministries of this congregation. Bring an end to hunger in our community and around the world. Merciful God, hear our prayer. Accept these prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of the world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Holy, mighty, merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. For in great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. It was on the night in which his betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper he took a cup. He gave thanks and he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated and come. For all has been made ready this day.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed Jesus, in, the na- in this rich meal of grace, you have fed us with your body and, br- and bread of life. Send us now forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. Amen. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, 763, My Life Flows On. Go in peace, Jesus meets you on the way.